This episode is sponsored by Stylebee. Get blowouts and makeup delivered to your door with a click of an app. This episode is also brought to you by Unstock, mobile first marketplace for authentic video. Hi, welcome to Valley Talks. My name is Sylvia Gorajek, and today I'm super happy to be joined by Sam Parr, co-founder and CEO of The Hustle, one of the fastest growing newsletter company in America. The Hustle is a daily news service targeting to millennials that grew from zero to 100,000 daily subscribers in 10 months. Sam, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Let's do it. Um, so you're saying that your content is mostly targeting millennials. Yes, um, millennial focused business news. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So is this really mostly millennials um, subscribing to your uh, news? Because yeah. So uh, like 75% of our readers are in between the 20 and 30 range. 20 and 30. Okay. Because I 20, feel, 30 years old. Right. Because yeah. I feel like, you know, the content is pretty universal. It's like, uh, it's very interesting for everyone. It's just the tone that you're, um, you know, presenting is super... Um, super fun, super light. Very I love um, it. conversational. Yeah. That's how we make it. We make it very conversational. So we have readers. I've had like an 80 year old woman email me back and say that she's a reader. Mm -hmm. But, um, and that's great. We just uh, don't purposely try to get those types of age groups. For us, for our business, it's advertising supported and we want a very specific audience. Um, and that's who we target. And so the hustle emerged kind of naturally from uh, HustleCon, yes. your conferences, annual conferences that you mm -hmm. are doing. Um, so it came about that you had so much content out of preparing for the conferences and after the conferences that you decided to be publishing it, right? Yeah, so we had this conference business or it was only like a, it wasn't like a, it was me running it by myself, but it was just small. I, I wasn't sure what to do with it. And I was doing it as a way to decide what I wanted to do next. And mm -hmm. we were doing it and people were coming from all over the world. We had many hundreds of people coming and we created content to promote it. And we realized that that content was reaching millions of people, whereas our conference was only reaching many hundreds of people. Yeah. And we're like, how can we make this huge? And so we had a, I had a personal set of goals, like I want to create something that does, uh, that reaches this many people, I want to employ this many people. I, I just had all these personal goals. I was like, damn, I think media actually, we just kind of perfectly fit it right into that, that, that my personal goals of, of wanting to do these things and media just happened to be the one. And why did you decide to go for newsletter um, style? You know, because thinking, you know, I would think that maybe if you publish this on the website, like all of it, you may have even more, yeah. you know, people visiting it. It's, you know, newsletters are always more engaging and it's harder to get people subscribe. Why did you decide for the newsletter? Yeah, a couple of reasons. Um, one, a newsletter is far more intimate. You mm -hmm. email your friends. You don't, if you... Um, publish a blog, you'll have friends read it. But when you really want to share something intimate and personal, you email your buddies. That's what you do. Um, the second reason is because it's easier to scale early on. So with email for the conference, I wouldn't sell tickets online. People would have to enter their email first because mm -hmm. 20% uh, of people would enter their email and only like 2% of people who would buy when you have web visitors. So it's like, oh damn, I'm just going to get those 20% of people give me their email and then I'll sell to them. And, and I saw that, that every, literally every time I clicked send, revenue went up. So we decided to do email because we wanted to A, have higher ad rates. The ad rates for email are really, really high. Mm -hmm. And two, because um, we can retain a user. So a user comes and signs up and then we're, we have a relationship with them and now every single day we talk to them. Whereas most people don't go to websites, a certain website, literally every day. And also because we want to self-fund the business, we're growing, we, we grow now off, we raise a small amount of funding, but we grow off cash flow, our cash flow mostly. And with email, we're able to scale up. So right now we reach um, a couple million people a month and we're only nine months in or something like that. Uh, you can't do that without, you can't do that, or you could do that, but it's just a little bit difficult to do that without um, funding for a normal blog. And are you, monetizing the newsletter yeah through the last couple new newsletters that i got i didn't see any ad in there yeah you probably didn't um 
So we did small tests last uh, December to see if we can get the really high CPM rates that we wanted, uh, and we did. Um, and then now what we do is we have a handful of like, sometimes we'll recommend products that we really like mm -hmm. and we'll make affiliates from there so we can make many thousands of dollars just from recommending some product that we like. Mm -hmm. But now starting in June, you're going to see a lot of things like says like brought to you by Pepsi, brought to you by mm -hmm. this brand, brought to you by this mm -hmm. brand. And uh, that's what we'll do. Yeah. So you're kind of like sponsoring this the same like, you know, podcasts are sponsored, right? Yep. You would get it for a newsletter. That's correct. And um, so let's talk a little more about the, uh, the content itself. Yeah. Uh, that's super interesting, exciting, and that's different than, yes. you know, many other um, websites and newsletters and stuff. First of all, when it comes to the, the tone, have you, I feel like you've, you have kept this since the very beginning, even since the conferences, right? You know, the, the conversational tone and like funny and stuff. Are you yourself, yourself like that? That's how it just started? Or how did you know that this is going to catch? Well, so it started with me in my kitchen, just writing emails. I would write emails to, I had a list of 200 friends and I would send emails to them and the open rates were really high and people responded, they're like, this is pretty funny. Then I studied copywriting a ton. I studied copywriting, I studied journalism, I read books on Ted Turner, the founder of CNN. I read books on some of the greatest copywriters. And my goal was to take the principles that I learned for copywriting and the principles I learned from traditional journalism and to put those together. Mm -hmm. And so those two things mixed with my natural tone, it just kind of created this voice. Um, and that's how I got started. And I, one of our philosophies is if everyone is going this way, then we should go this way. And we noticed that a lot of the um, websites that we, I would read, like the New York Times, um, Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, they're super dry. Mm -hmm. Like they don't say things. Official. Right? Yeah, they're official. They don't converse like you and I converse. Yeah. But with our generation, the best way to connect with someone is to converse just like your, the, what we say is the intelligent, no bullshit friend. Mm -hmm. We're just that buddy. <laughs> and so we just took like a couple of those principles and created this voice. And then now that we've hired writers, we worked really hard on creating a guide and a course that trains them. Mm. And so we train all of our writers uh, to speak in a certain tone of voice. And we have certain principles and certain guides that help them, um, every single word on the, on, that they type has a purpose. And so that's how it works. How many writers do you have right now? Yeah, so when we, started, when we first launched, we made the mistake of hiring too fast. So when we first launched, we had uh, a small team of four or five people four or five editorial. Now we've scaled it back to where there's, um, we only have a team of six and uh, three editorial people and the rest are on growth. I can imagine why you would hire that many at the beginning because it takes time, right? To deliver this content, to like edit this and all that. So if you want to have a lot of it, you would feel like you need a lot of people, right? Yeah, so eventually what, you know, like the way, the best way to grow is you produce lots of high quality articles. So something mm -hmm. like, um, um, Business Insider, they'll produce three or 400 articles a day. And I think that we'll eventually scale to 80 or 100 a day or something like that. And early on, we're like, let's just do that right away. Yeah. And that didn't, um, that didn't work. That just wasn't the right way to what, do it. What didn't work? Um, producing, so like each writer can write three or four articles a day. Mm -hmm. um, and that's awesome. And we're gonna continue to do that. But or, or rather, we'll do that soon. Um, but we tried to do that from the get go before they had real editorial direction. Mm -hmm. So we were like, all right, go on, do your thing without any foundation. Now we've got um, millions of readers and they know why they come to our site and what to get. Whereas uh, before it was mostly a hodgepodge of, of things mm -hmm. and that didn't work out well. So now we've got this foundation. So we're going to scale that. How many people are there right now at um, The Hustle? Um, six full-time people, and then we had a team of interns. And when you, uh, when you hired them, you, you, you said that you will have a guide um, of how they are supposed to be writing stuff and, you know, um, of the style and everything. Um, but how do you choose them? How, how do you see that so they are a good fit? Originally, we hired people that were journalists, so people from some of the top universities who worked at some of the top ed uh, companies, mm -hmm. and we somehow convinced them to work for us, and that did not work out well. Um, those people didn't 
those people did not work they were us. probably hard to convert to your uh, style right? yeah it did not work out well then we made a recent hire this guy um, Kendall and he just kind of got it and then we gave him the we kind of we helped refine him and really hone in on the voice but what we have found is the people who thrive in our organization are the ones who we enjoy being around mm -hmm. the people who are super driven and are really highly intelligent and then um, they just can have a conversation. So the way that we describe what we want our writers to be, um, they're going to be they're journalists, and we, but we want them to be an A plus storyteller, mm -hmm. and they could be a C writer. You could be a C writer and an A plus storyteller, and people will say this, this is the greatest writer ever. But if you're a A plus writer, like you know the grammar and you know how to um, do a bunch of the 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 right tactics and skills on paper, but you suck at finding, what, you, you, don't, you don't know what's interesting, then it's like, you, you suck, no one cares. And how are you choosing your content? How do you know, uh, what do you want to write about? Yeah, so it's 50-50 data-driven and editorial-driven. So mm -hmm. we've got tools where we can see what's trending and what's popular, and we try to throw ourselves into that conversation and take something that people care about, but we repackage it in a way that millennials give a shit about. Yeah. And um, the second way is we just do what we think is cool. And, uh, you know, I, once again, I will say that I love this style. And it's also very courageous, I think, because, you know, whenever someone signs up to your newsletter, you, um, you reply with, like, look what you did, <laughs> you <laughs> Yeah, jerk, we right? say that the subject <laughs> so, is, look what you did, you little jerk. Yeah. And then it's a and, long email about uh, when yeah, they signed what, up this what happened and all that you know and I like it and it's the first place where I saw this and so it's also very inspiring I must say and um, that's why I was wondering how did you know that this is going to to work but as you're saying you, you first started with those newsletters to friends well I didn't know that it was gonna work yeah it was just iterations we just kind of I, I had a blog, um, my personal blog that I had been blogging on for a while, and I was able to get traffic. I was, some, there would be some times where I'd have 50,000 people come to the site in one day. What were you blogging about? Um, I had a book club, so mm -hmm. I would blog about my thoughts on certain books that I was reading. Um, I quit drinking alcohol, so I wrote about that process. I traveled the country after I sold my first company, and I blogged about that, um, and things like that. And it was just like funny, stupid stuff that I would write about. And I, I learned that people enjoy this type of tone. So I didn't know exactly that it was going to work, but I was, I had a hunch that it would. And we also looked at, so our content, we consider it like Vice plus Wall Street Journal. And I, both of those work. So I was like, like, what if we just made them the same thing? And let's move a little back in time. Yeah. And so... Um you had a room a roommate matching yeah. company yeah. and i see you rolling your eyes no i didn't roll my eyes <laughs> but i mean i know it was a while ago and it's just so many topics we could talk about but for that specific topic i wanted to ask you because you say that you learned so much yeah. uh, during that time before you even got acquired right yeah what did you really learn uh from that uh, everything. So when I first moved to San Francisco, I didn't know what WordPress was. I didn't know what, like, I didn't know anything. When did you move? How many years ago? Uh, four years, only four years ago. Yeah. So, so, so I was in college and I had other businesses that I ran, like more like brick and mortar companies. And that paid, that helped pay my way through school. And then I learned what the internet was. And when I moved out here, I didn't know anything. I didn't know how to like, I didn't know how to buy a domain name. I didn't know how to like, I didn't know anything. I didn't even have a Gmail email. Like, I didn't know anything. <laughs> Why did you move in the first place? Two reasons. One, I lived in Australia, in Sydney, Australia, for a minute, or for eight months, six months, or something like that. And when I got back, I was like, oh, I want to go back there. That was amazing, but it's too far away. So I Googled what city in America oh. is most similar to Sydney, Australia. And a lot of people suggested San Francisco. The second reason was... Does it, is it like that? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. It, it would be like it if, there, if the weather were better. If the weather were better, then it would be just like it. Okay. But it, it is the most similar city, mm -hmm. I think. The weather is just the only big difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the second reason was because I had this hot dog cart in, San, or in Nashville where I lived, where I mm -hmm. sold hot dogs. That was my company. And I realized that like, if I go to bed, I don't make money. So the internet is cool. 
because it goes all, it's never closed. Mm -hmm. And so I just like typed in some of my favorite companies and I noticed they're all based right around here. So I was like, I'll just go out there. So what did you really learn from um, this uh, room matching? Company? Yeah, so we started the roommate, my, my co-founder started it first and then I joined him and we sold it like 10 or nine months later. It was yeah, it was super fast. I want to ask you also, how could you do this so fast? It was fast, it yeah. was very fast. Um, so the first thing, what I learned, um, I learned that like a 20 something, like you can create something that people pay for, which is super cool. Um, the internet is a, a level, pretty level playing field. Um, you can kind of act like you're bigger or smaller mm -hmm. than you want to be. You could like mm -hmm. put on this front, you could do anything. It's really level, you know? Um, so I learned that people, that you could create something that people will actually want to pay for. I also learned not to sell yourself short. Um, we sold too early and we didn't get what we were really worth. And uh, That's what you think right now? Yeah. Um, and do so you, I, do, you sh do you say how much, um, how much you were bought for? Um, no. No? Okay. No, okay. I, I, didn't have to, I, I, I didn't have to work for a year. Or something like that. Okay. I had fi my finances were taken care of for a little bit. Yeah, that's how you actually financed yourself uh, while you were preparing the first conference. And yeah. And then I'm very good at saving as well. Okay. Yes. So I've I'm not good at that. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't know. It's just so many things that I want to have around me that I'm like, okay, um, you know, I want to have it now. I'm like the most frugal guy on earth. So wow. at my company, they make fun of me because like. The other, the other day we had a team retreat and we went out of town and like they wanted to buy the potato chips. I was like, get the off brand because they're on sale for cheaper and we'll, we're going to save like four bucks. Like I'm like meticulous like that. Yeah, but I feel like it's harder for women, you know, it's just usually yeah. like women are more spending more. Yeah, you guys have to buy a lot, a lot more shit. <laughs> we do. We totally do. Okay, so you sold um, your company and then you worked um, for, yeah, for a while. I worked there for a year and one day. Yeah. So I was um, the one day after my year was when I had some equity vest. Mm -hmm. I took off on that, that first day after I quit. Yeah. So that's where you, why you stayed. Yeah. Right. And how, how did it feel to work on it at that at, time? At, at the company that bought it? Yeah. Oh, it was horrible. I, um, I probably would have been fired if I didn't quit. I was well, not very good. I was immature. I was wild, a little, a lot wilder, and uh, I did not know how to. It was. I did not know how to do things the right way. Could they actually fire you? Yeah, probably. You know, right? Cal California's. Yeah. And, yeah, they could. They could. Yeah. Yes. And you did you worry about that at all? No. 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 I, no. And that's also when you started working on the first um, conference. Yeah, okay, so moved here, started this roommate thing, worked there for, or did that for eight or nine months, it got sold, and then worked at the company that bought it for a year and one day, and then the, the second day after I was, like, quit, uh, I started working on HustleCon. Mm. Um, the first conference happened six weeks or seven weeks after I started working on it, and... Uh, yeah, so you had really just very short time to do that. Yeah. But you wanted to do it as a, as a conference style, not like a meetup, right? No, like a, like a, you say concert? No, conference. I want to be a concert. Like, I like live music, but I'm, don't, I'm not a musician. And I lived in Nashville, when, that's where I went to college, and I studied music business. Do you know business. Taylor Swift? Uh, we would see her walking around. Okay. Before she was huge, when she, but when sure. she was just a country artist. Yeah. Uh, they all lived there. Every, every country artist lives in Nashville. Mm -hmm. So you see, she's, you know, like really famous now, but... Yeah. Uh, you see all the country artists walking now, mm -hmm. walking around there. And I studied music business. That's why I wanted to be in the music industry. Mm -hmm. And so when I started this um, HustleCon, I was like, how can I make this feel like a concert, but be uh, a like business conference? A business conference, right? It's a nice combination. Yeah, I was like, well, let's make it cool. So we served alcohol. Um, Did you have the lights? Uh, the light. Uh, it was all uh, dark. dark. It was. It, we only do them in theaters, concert like mm -hmm. theaters where there's concerts. Mm -hmm. So the last one was at Paramount. That's where Prince played at the Paramount uh, two weeks before he died. Um, and so we played there. We, we did it there. We, we only do it at theaters. And so the original vision was to make it feel like a concert. Um, and so that's what we did. And so the first time I did it alone. Um, and you got tickets just through your network? 
Yeah, um, well, there was people who I didn't know that were there, but uh, original, I, know, but I didn't have any money to like spend it, on advertising, yeah. so it just spread from. Okay. I would t I told my initial friends of like I had like two hundred people on an email list, and that email list grew a little bit, but not a lot to like a hundred or, or sorry to like a thousand or twelve hundred or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I would send these funny emails, and people just came, and we had three hundred and fifty people come. Yeah, but I'm wondering how how did you make them pay like two hundred dollars? The average ticket, I think I, I had it listed at 350 bucks online, but I gave discounts and I think it was mm -hmm. probably the average ticket 200 bucks or 175, something like that. Um, how did I make? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Maybe what. because of this when people, format. Every what? The format you were offering. Yeah, it was interesting. It was super interesting, but like every time so a sale came in for the first two weeks, I was like, Holy shit! Like I can't believe it's working. And who was actually um, the speakers on that conference? I mean, yeah, in general, so like was that was all the founders? It was the the rule from day one has been founders. Um, so we would have like you know Polyvore. Have you heard of Polyvore.com? Mm. Um, they just sold for like three hundred million bucks. It's a fashion website, okay. so we'd have like Polyvore. So they would come for the speakers because they were already interesting stories, right? Yeah. So the speakers came. It's all, it's all founders and CEOs and their job is to recruit. So they came because they wanted to recruit new people mm -hmm. and they would come and speak for free. And the speakers came, or the attendees came to hear the speakers and to meet one another. And then sponsors came to meet all of them. And so- Did you have hard time on looking for sponsors for that thing? Well, most conferences only make money from sponsors, it seems. Yeah. I made all my money from ticket sales and some from sponsors. Usually what we do is we get sponsors to pay for the whole event mm -hmm. and then we get um, revenue a lot of revenue comes from ticket. ticket sales right and so early on my budget was super small I think I spent twelve thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars on that first event and I was able to get so I would get like I would like call someone and I would get like a three thousand dollar sponsorship and I would take that check and give it right to the venue mm -hmm. and it was like like I would be like all right um, the venue costs this much money. All right, I better go find that sponsor. So before I paid that venue, I would go and find a sponsor and get it and just give that check right to that person. Same with lunch, same with all this other stuff. So was it hard? Um, yeah, it was hard. It just took time. It's time consuming. You it's just so, gotta. I just so hit the, you, just hit, you just hit the phones. I mean, you just. I just call a hundred people yeah. a day. You just do it. I see. Um, and so you. So the next conference was the one that you pretty much sold with the infographics, right? And the content. Yeah, so after the conference, after the first one, I took like six months off and I just traveled and I reflected and I was like, mm. what, should I, what do I want to do with my life? And then at the end I was like, or not what, what do I want to do with my life, but what project do I want to work on next? And I was like, yeah. damn, you know, like this, this, me, this conference thing, maybe like at first I dismissed it. I was like, this is just a way to kill time. And then I was like, this actually might be something real. Mm -hmm. um, it might be interesting. And so I called up my co-founder from the old company and I said, um, come on, let's do this. Uh, you want to join? Like, I think that there's some, sp I don't completely have the answer as to how we're going to grow this or what it's going to become, but I have, a, f I have a, a past of just doing shit and then new avenues open up. I was like, let's just do it and we'll figure something out as we go. And so he joined me and we threw a second one. And he's, uh, he did the graphics? Yeah, he did the graphics, I because did the writing. it was just two of you, It was right? two of us and we threw it and after like, we had like 60 or 70 days and we had like 600 people come or 550 people yeah. come or something like that. You're saying that all the speakers that you invited, you called emailed them and you're sharing, you know, the style of the emails, which yeah. is kind of, you know, consistent with the style that you're using right now for the hustle. It's all the same. Right? And um, it's all super casual, yeah. very conversational, but also professional. Um, and you had to bug them like 10 times sometimes. Maybe more. You so, for example, some speakers who I emailed for the first time never responded to me mm -hmm. or said no. And so the second time I would continue emailing them. So there'd be someone. So, for example, a speaker from this year, I had been emailing this guy for two years. Who? Cool. Uh, Otis Chandler from Goodreads. Mm -hmm. um, I had been emailing him, maybe it was a year. A year and a half. It's just like a long time. Like if you look at my email history, it's like one thread with literally 50 emails, and they just like either say no or they just don't respond. So I just do it all the time. How do you get the emails? The oh, that's address? easy. You can just there's so many tools out there that help you figure it out. But most of the time, you just type in like their first name at their URL or their last name or their first. You're trying it this way sometimes too. Yeah, I just do it manually, and then you just 
Gmail tells you, or I'll just like literally type in every combination I can think of and I'll just hit send. Um, yeah, that's not very hard. Um, I mean, like I've emailed like Jeff Bezos from mm -hmm. his, it's just Jeff at Amazon.com. If you email him enough, they're gonna, they'll, they'll respond. You know, San Francisco and Silicon Valley is pretty small area. And did you, did you also try like looking through your network? Like well, intros and stuff, you know? Yeah, but at the time, I've got a, a great network now. Now I could like, call anyone. But before, I didn't have a good network. So it was just cold email, and I just had to okay. convince them. It, was, it sucked. It was hard. It was really because hard. Because for me, it feels like even, you know, with my network, whenever I put someone's name on Facebook, it, you usually start having at least one friend in common, you know? Now, yeah, that yeah. works great now. Okay. But like before, I didn't really have a network. Okay. So I was like... Now I can. Now that's what I do, really. But before, it uh, was not that easy. So actually, whenever you know, I look at whatever you're sharing uh, of your story online, uh, it's like you know the, the subscribers doubled and doubled, or the attendees doubled and doubled. Um, what's your recipe for it? Um, you know, aside of just the content, how are you um, sharing it? How are you getting all the new people that come in? Um, okay, so for um, the conference and the newsletter, um, well, first of all, it seems like it doubles all the time, and it does. It's been growing great, but it's like it doesn't feel all that awesome all the time. I know, so. right? Yeah, I want to talk to you about this as well. Um, like, um, but uh, we have so the first conference was like three fifty, I think, or three hundred. I forget. I think three fifty. The second one was five fifty, and then this last one was like seventeen hundred. So the the first two events that we did, it grew the newsletter. So, you know, it, it did the same thing. Now, the way our media property grows, um, it grows three ways. Mm -hmm. um, one, just from viral content. So some days we'll put something out and we'll have 100,000 people in one day visit the site. It just, or 200,000, I mean, that's just, it's just natural. We'll just create something. We kind of, we know how to create viral content. Mm -hmm. And- uh, How to create the viral it's content? It's tough. <laughs> so when I say know how, I mean that like, Two team. out of ten articles will go viral. But it's, well, it's still a lot. Come on. Yeah, it's still pretty good. Um, so that just came from repetition. So I would write five articles a day, and I would just learn. I, you just understand what emotions trigger sharing. So now we know what we've got data and we've got insight. So we know what emotions are likely to get shared. So we write with that, mm -hmm. trying to get that type of what emotion. emotions. Anger. Um, yeah, anger works well. Anger, um, like laughter and awe, usually are the mm -hmm. three best. Things that are depressing, do, do not share. Okay. Um, and then we kind of knew like how to format articles, like we know how, exactly how to do it. How so, about ambitious stuff? That that there is a lot of knowledge behind this. Um, well, that's considered awe. Okay. For us, we call that awe. So when someone reads something and they see how much work has gone into it, mm -hmm. or um, how amazing the content is, at the end when they're reading it, they're like, "I am amazed that this exists." Um, mm -hmm or that someone is doing this, that gets shared a lot. Um, so for growing the content, we've got three ways. One is the viral content, um, and that's learning how search engines work and what people share and things like that. And that's really complicated, but we're, we've done a great job of understanding how it works. The second way is through partnerships. So we have a full-time person who works in partnerships, and that takes a lot of just business development skill where mm -hmm. she'll call someone and we we do, we share each other's stuff and things like that, but basically it's us swinging above our weight where we try to convince like Men's Journal or GQ Magazine or something like this to share our content. Um, and that just takes a lot of just cold calling and yeah. hard work. And the third one is we built software. So we have ambassadors. So we've got hundreds of ambassadors um, and they get a unique URL. And when they get friends to join our newsletter using their unique URL, we reward them with access to our private mm -hmm. community as well as t-shirts and hoodies and free tickets to our conferences and things like that. And so that's how it works. And so we've got hundreds of those ambassadors. And so in order to become an ambassador, you have to get five people to join. In order to get a t-shirt, you need like, I think it's 10 emails. In order to get a hoodie, you need 100 emails. And so we've got, all, we've got this, these tools that mm -hmm. uh, do this. Um, okay, so we mentioned that there is a lot of, uh, you know, um, stories online that you are growing and growing, and it's been so awesome, it's been so amazing. But uh, what were the toughest moments, or toughest times, or are they still happening? What's, yeah, uh, they're still happening. So like, like we, we do well, but it's like, one month it'll be shitty, and I'll go to work, like I'll work like every single day, so that's like 30 days. I'll take Sunday or Saturday off, but 
you'll like wait, work six days a week and you're like, nothing is working, nothing is working, this is horrible, I hate this, I want to quit, like this is, this just sucks. Like it's not growing the same way as it was last Or time. it just is not, it's just going down, like oh my god, like we're, we're losing, we're losing, and then something happens and you're like, oh my god, it's working, people love this, like, like when you we go first, crazy with this. Yeah, like we had like an ambassador one time, 3,000 people to join. Because Some influencer, right? He yeah. must have had his own audience, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and he just sent it out because he enjoyed it. And we're like, oh my god, like people love this. Like We're going to conquer the world. And that was like, definitely helped growth big time. Mm -hmm. um, or like, we had a problem with our email list once where we were going to spam. And we're like, fuck, we're screwed. We're, we're, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. we, this, we're going to go out of business. And then we fix it somehow. And But like, it feels... It feels like it's not working more often than it feels like it's working. Mm. We have really ambitious goals. There's 80 million millennials in America. 40 million of them are college educated. Mm -hmm. I want to have 40 million people come to the site every single day. That's, How many are there coming every day right now? Um, well, we're an email newsletter, so yeah, we have 100 like 120,000 people so far. So it's um, that's daily. Yeah. Oh, and you want 40 million daily? Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's the markets. I want I want those people to come to the site every day, and when you have goals like that, when you're only getting like only a hundred twenty thousand a day, yeah, you're like so like <laughs> no, right that's now, lame. like our reach right now is probably amongst a, a couple different channels, visitors, email, and social. It's like maybe three million a month, daily, uh, monthly coming, which is okay. It's okay for now, but we're like, okay, how do I get? How do we turn that th mm -hmm. that three million into thirty million? And then how do we keep growing? I mean, it, like when so when you have these goals like that, it doesn't feel awesome all the time that you're not doing, you're not hitting those goals. So we know that like it's going to take another four years probably to get to where we really want to go. Mm -hmm. When you started the hustle, that's uh, like ten months ago, right? Yeah. Well, we nine or we raised months. we raised money in the summertime, and then we started like throwing stuff out there in July. And then I consider our official, our real launch to be the third week of July, but I usually say August 1st because it's easier to remember because yeah. I don't remember <laughs> what the date was in July. Yeah, but in June last year, you shared a post with what's what's going to happen. You were kind of announcing the whole thing. Yeah. And, you know, a post and a video, and you said that you have like $500,000 to spend. Yeah, we had about 500 grand in the bank to try something new. From raising money and from your revenue from the Mostly from, most, it was mostly our money. Yeah. So, and did you raise anything in the meantime? Um, we've now, at this point, we've raised around, we've raised very little comparatively, um, about $300,000. We're mm -hmm. growing mostly from making money from um, the company, and I imagine that to the 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 goal and the scale that we want to get to, we're, we are going to raise money. But our goal right now is mm -hmm. to make revenue and profit, and raise money only to accelerate growth, as opposed to raise money to survive. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. So you're not spending too much time on. Um relationships with investors and you know, well, this kind of stuff. I am, but not because I want to raise money from them because that's just the business that we're in. We're, we're in the tech. We, we talk about lots of tech and investors, and so I just have relations with these people naturally. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our speakers are also investors. And so mm -hmm. we're fortunate that um, the people who we raise money from are also our readers and the people who we write about. So okay. it's just coincidental. Are they offering you um, funding that you're not taking yet? Funding has not been an issue yet. The need is there. Our numbers are great. It's clearly a gap in the marketplace mm -hmm. that we're filling. Um, my co-founder and I have proved that we're at least somewhat competent. Yeah. To, I mean, we're not. It's hard to say if we're going to be a success yet, but at least we know how to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And so, for that, for our situation, funding isn't particularly hard to come by. Um, it sometimes it's hard to come by for people who we run, want funding from, um, or at the really ambitious terms that we want. Mm -hmm. But in general, uh, basic necessity money, like basic money, has not been a challenge. Yeah, I was just thinking if there are, uh, you know, investors who really love what you're doing and they want to be part of it and they just are anxious that you're not taking it. Yet. We have turned down money, yes. Um, and that's kind of scary to turn down money. But it's just against our principles. Mm -hmm. um, we are not going to take money from people um, unless we prove that our business is viable and awesome. 
Yeah, um, and it also, you know, adds up a stress uh, to the whole thing, right? And like, yeah, it adds stress to it. I don't. Yeah. I like that stress. Okay. That's a high risk, high reward, and that's the type of business. That's the type of person I'm in. I am. So I enjoy that. But um, I also like doing whatever I want, and I don't want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can prove that our pirate ship can sail on its own, then any money that we have, it's just a little bit of wind in our sails, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone telling us what to do. Yeah, someone just stepping in and taking the board seat and yeah. just, you know. Yeah. the whole thing yeah so coming back to my um, question a year ago you announced that you have this five hundred uh, yeah. thousand dollars and you're going to and you said like watch what we are going to do with this for another year yeah so that was like a little bit of a PR stunt but yeah okay. I think the title and was you, watch us recklessly blow half a million dollars do you remember all the titles of your of your post <laughs> uh, well we've only had like a thousand articles I remember a lot of them Okay, and so and I wrote it. So I you wrote, about, yeah. yeah, for sure, at that time, right? So where you um, and you are, we're also promising that you would be sharing, you know, um, insights of how it's all going yeah. along the way. And we have done some of that. We, we haven't have, done as much as we should, but we have done some. Yeah. So since it's almost a year since you since you announced that um, or started that, um, how do you feel right now? What do you think? We are ahead of where we thought we'd be, so we're proud about that. But what I've learned was even when you hit the goals that you want to hit, it's like only satisfying it's for like a minute. Enough. You're like, okay, like that was like, let's go harder. Like this isn't enough. And did you spend all the 500K? Uh, no, 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 no. Well, we're profitable. Mm -hmm. Did we spend? No. Did you plan to be profitable during the first year? Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's been the goal from day one. We're, I'm, very, I'm from Missouri, my dad's an entrepreneur, and the type of business that they do, it's you, you, you buy low, you sell for higher. So it's, um, I'm very much on the side of making revenue from the get-go. What's uh, new coming for The Hustle? Yeah, so um, our newsletter is gonna get, get even better. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna try to grow that to be, I want it to have a million people on there by the end of next year. I have one question here that I now remember. Uh, also, you shifted the frequency recently yeah. with your newsletter. It yeah, was before like, it was, originally it was one day a week, then it was two days a week, and now it's five days a week. How come this change? Yeah, so when we originally launched it, we would write articles and we get people to click off to our articles. And then we're like, well, this whole news thing is interesting. We, instead of doing like evergreen content, we kind of like doing news as well. We find people like that, so we start doing more news stuff. And then we're like, wait, why do we even have people click off? Like, the, it would be a way better user experience if like everything was there and you don't on your phone and you don't even have to click any anywhere. Let's just put it all right in the email. And then to do that, that means we have to summarize some of the stuff, which means it's a little easier and faster to write. Mm -hmm. So now we email every single day, and it tells you all the news that's going on in the world that you need to, that you care about and, and what, what it means to you. And it's also shorter than what you were delivering on the website. Correct. And you are still publishing some stuff on the website, but it's less? It's mostly for growth-related reasons, though. So uh, we've got partnerships with Forbes and Fortune, and uh, when we publish stuff, it goes onto their site. So what's there coming for the hustle? Uh, so we want to get to a million users, uh, a million subscribers by the end, by the end of next year. Um, the email is going to be getting even better, and uh, we're exploring video as well. In what way? Um, you'll see. <laughs> All right, let's finish uh, here. Sam, um, it was so much fun to have you here on the show. Thank you so much. I'm your big fan, by the way. Thank you. And Become an ambassador. Yeah, I could, for sure. And you for Valley Talks as well. Right? I love that. I've heard John, um, oh, my uh, co-office mate, not co, co worker, not roommate, but like uh, we work in the same office. Build mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We uh, I enjoyed watching it, and uh, we'll be sharing this for sure. Thanks so much. Sam.